Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am Peter Goodwin. I serve as the chair of the ad hoc committee of the, to review monitoring, modeling, and other relevant scientific activities that support the long-term operations of the Central Valley Project. Uh, this is a study that was commissioned by the US Bureau of Reclamation with the National Academies. The committee and the National Academies acknowledge that Northern California exists on the occupied territory of more than 100 tribes. This land has been stewarded by indigenous peoples since time immemorial. We acknowledge the critical importance of the land and water to the indigenous people of California today, and the existence of tribal communities and preservation of traditional indigenous ways of life depend on the landscape and the environment. We welcome the input and knowledge from tribal communities at any time throughout our study. On the logistics, uh, in case of emergency, I'd like to point out that the uh, emergency exits to this meeting hall are on the left-hand side through the corridor, and there's also an emergency exit on my right. So in this first cycle of the review, the committee has been asked to look at old and middle river flow management, particularly related to the effects on salmon and delta smart. We've been asked to look at the science around the summer fall delta smelt habitat and related and related to specifically to look at the Shasta cold water pool management. We've also been asked to look more generally at recommendations on how modeling, monitoring, and decision support could be enhanced in the long term. We're now four months into this study, and this is the third exploratory meeting where the committee and the science community can learn what is being done, what are the nuances and the challenges faced looking forward. We would like to thank the experts who guided us on the field trip yesterday to Shasta and Red Bluff, uh, Jeff Sutton, Aaron Hall, Holly Dawley, Bill Pointries, and the USBR team. As a reminder, in the last meeting, uh, we had a field trip to the Yolo Bypass and the Sassoon Marsh, and we'd like to thank all of the participants that contributed in both the field trip and the meeting. It's so much better uh, to learn in the field than it is through PowerPoint. The meeting, all 17 committee members attended, as well as the four academy staff and more than 32 presenters. Uh, Dave Mooney, who was the prime architect of this study, provided clarity on the scope and what re reclamation and others hope to achieve from this review. We received a detailed overview of modeling of the long-term operations and actions. We had in-depth discussion on the summer fall habitat actions by both reclamation and the Department of Water Resources, which covered the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. We greatly appreciated the community interested party input at the end of the meeting and the extensive materials that followed those comments. We learned a lot of information about how the models are used, the challenges of modeling such a complex open system, and many aspects um, related to operating the system. Today is no less complicated as we look at the Shasta cold water pool management. And this is the third of the three exploratory meetings, as I mentioned. Today, we are here to listen, uh, to receive materials. And I'd like to emphasize the open mic session at the end of today at 4.15 PM. And I would encourage you, if you wish to speak, to please sign up on the sheet outside this room. And if you're participating online today, to contact Maya uh, through the webpage to register to make comments. With that, before I introduce our first two speakers of the day, uh, I just asked the uh, Academy leader, uh, Dr. Ehlers, uh, did I miss anything in the introductory remarks? So we're good to go. So the first session today is we're going to have an introduction to the Winter Run Chinook of the Sacramento River by Dr. Johnson. 
And then that will be followed by Dr. Dana talking about some of the, the models and the science behind that action. I'm going to introduce both of the first sessions morning speakers together. And I think they've requested that we'll get the whole picture first of all uh, through the two presentations. And then we'll uh, open the floor to questions from the committee members. And if we have time, I'll uh, open to the general audience as well. So Dr. Rachel Johnson is the program lead of the Salmon Life History. She works in the Fisheries Ecology Division of NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center. She's more than 14 years of experience filling critical gaps that have been used to better manage water and fisheries resources in California. Rachel has pioneered, pioneered isotope tools to better understand migration, habitat use, contaminant exposure, and connectivity in fish populations. Her work focuses on understanding mechanisms of population viability and aids in determining critical habitats for reproduction, survival, and growth of endangered species and those targeted by fisheries. She is well known as a translational ecologist dedicated to communicating, synthesizing science to ensure that scientific information is available to resource managers, decision makers, and the public, and it's communicated clearly. Our second speaker is Dr. Eric Danner. Uh, Eric leads the biophysical ecology team at the Fisheries Ecology Division of NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center. His team develops decision support frameworks that use linked biological and physical models to examine the impacts of weather, climate, water operations, and infrastructure, including habitat restoration and reintroduction of anadromous fish populations in California's Central Valley. Dr. Dana is widely published on a variety of topics related to anadromous fish and water management, including models which have been developed uh, under his leadership of spawning habitat, bioenergetics, thermal habitat, migration dynamics, river and reservoir temperature dynamics, and the full salmon life cycle. So with that, I'll turn the mic across to Dr. Johnson, I believe you're going to go first. So I've been given all of these things, this microphone and this clicker, and I speak with my hands. So this is going to be a challenge for me. I feel like I have like a straight jacket on by having these things in my hand like this. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you today. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. And um, it is a great pleasure. I'm talking about one of my favorite things to talk about, and that is the diversity of California salmon and how we try to manage them on our, um, on our, on our altered and regulated landscapes. Mm -hmm. Glitch number one. John? Okay, so the framework of my talk, Laura asked me to talk about the life history of Linda Renshin at Salmon, but also a whole bunch of other specific things. And so this is the roadmap for the talk today. So first I'm going to talk about how the landscape in California creates salmon and how that landscape over evolutionary time periods is incredibly important for the life history diversity and the unique salmon that we have in California. And it also shapes the juvenile behaviors. And so I'm going to be talking about how salmon are incredible risk spreaders, how they spread their juveniles across space and time as part of their resiliency portfolio due to the really dynamic habitats and climate we have in California. And then I'm going to talk about the vulnerability that we have in our salmon when we remove them from the habitats that they have co-evolved with, and specifically how the eggs for winter intervention of salmon are particularly vulnerable now that they're no longer in their historical ancestral habitats. I'm then going to transition to the viability of winter runs specifically. I do the viability assessments for all the Central Valley salmon, and I'm going to specifically talk about hatchery. I know that you guys went to the Livingston Stone Hatchery um, just yesterday. I'm going to talk about how the hatchery is um, creating a greater risk of extinction for winter run salmon. And then I'm going to end with a hope spot. I see two ciscus here. 
that with my Win Among friends, and I'm so grateful um, for your partnership and having you here today. And that is truly the hope spot and where I'm centering a lot of my work right now. So I will end with that. Okay, so salmon have evolved reciprocity with their habitats. And I'm first gonna talk about how salmon shape their habitats. Um, and this is one of my favorite papers by Alex Vermeer, who talks about how just the small movement of female salmon making reds and moving that fine segment on evolutionary scales, I mean, at the scale of millennia, rivers that have salmon have literally, the salmon in this very act have moved and eroded mountains. So this very act of salmon spawning shapes our landscape. They also feed our landscapes. So when we think about the marine derived nutrients that they bring from the ocean into the fresh water, this is a plug of nutrients in this very nutrient scarce habitat. And it feeds everything from the aquatic insects to the plant life there, to the scavengers that bring the carcasses to the soils, to the soil microbes that feed the plants. They're all connected with this nitrogen that the salmon bring back to the, um, to the freshwater ecosystems. This is one of my favorite papers by title because it's called Salmon and Wine. But the isotopes also tell the story that when you look at the vineyards, you actually also see the signal of salmon in our California grape systems as well. So they're incredibly important for our habitats. And this reciprocity isn't just between salmon and habitat, but salmon habitat is equal, right? So this is a picture that was made um, by one of my colleagues in the West Coast region. And it's a rendition of a story that was told by Chief Sisk about how the tribes would make fires all along the Sacramento River to to highlight the, so the sky for the returning salmon so that they can navigate themselves back to the high elevation habitats in the Macaw. And so this relationship between salmon habitat and people is deep in time. And the Winnemum were the first stewards and, and resource users of the um, Macaw salmon. Um, and that this relationship and this reciprocity um, has been lost. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Okay, so the California habitat and its diversity is incredibly important for the four runs of Chinook salmon that are genetically distinct here in California. We are blessed with this diversity for Chinook. We are the only place that has four runs of genetically distinct salmon that have co-evolved with this diverse landscape. And it's because of our kind of mild winters that we are able to have salmon year round on our landscape. And the salmon are programmed to leave the ocean at particular times. So they're named for that. So the salmon that leave in the fall, the late fall, the winter, the spring, are all leaving the ocean at this particular time. And they're leaving the ocean at this particular time because it benefits them to do so. So the winter and the spring run um, leave the ocean and they enter the freshwater habitat at a time of year that's um, unique for them. And so when we think about the, the flows, the high flows in the high elevation habitats in the winter and the spring recession, these animals are showing up into that habitat that they can only access at that time of year. So spring run Chinook salmon, even their muscle um, is built in a way to allow them to do this migration that's fattier. They're built for this migration to get up into these high elevations that's different than fall run. Their eggs are not yet ripe, and that's because they have to go up into this high elevation habitat. It takes time for them to do that. Their eggs then mature and they spawn in the fall. And that's different from fall run that come in with their, their eggs mature for the valley floor and ready to spawn. And so this is these traits that these animals have are built to be co-evolved with these habitats, tightly linked. And the ability for salmon to home back to their natal rivers, which is just this incredible thing that salmon do, reinforces that local adaptation, this co-evolved gene complexes that they have. It's no wonder, it's no surprise that when we block the high elevation habitat, that it's spring run and winter run, these two kind of runs of salmon that are of conservation concern but aren't thriving. And it's because their habitat has been eliminated, right? So on the left is the historical habitat where salmon used to spawn in high elevation habitats. On the right-hand side is the dams that have been built and blocked access to this high elevation habitat. So we've selected four valley floor, floor spawners. The fall run is the backbone of the fishery because we have no longer provided access to the, the necessary habitat for winter and spring run to, to thrive. This is a figure from my colleague Stuart Munch's work in global chain biology, just kind of stylistically highlighted in that. So when we remove the mountains, we no longer have the mountain climbers. The winter run, they're gone um, from their historical habitats, right? These high elevation rivers, we've now compressed them all into the lower valley floor. And we think that they're supposed to 
su um, succeed there all together in the same habitat template. And this loss of high elevation habitat not only has influenced the ability of the adults to do their jobs well in, in the way that they're looking adapted, but it also affects the way that their juveniles are able to thrive on the landscape. So work by, uh, in our lab by my colleague Flora Cordleone, um, published in Nature and Climate Change, shows that these yearlings that are basically like unicorns on the landscape, we never see them. They're monitored, and we never see these yearlings in our monitoring program, and yet when we look at the adults, the adult spring run that returned to Mill and Deer Creek where this high elevation cold water habitat still remains, in drought years, only the yearlings can, are the ones that survive to come back to the adults. So we look at their ear bones, their oblas, and we can look and see what these adults that survive, how they use the landscapes as juveniles. And it's only these yearlings that stay in this cold high elevation water, grow really slowly, and they leave in the fall. And that's key. Because if you leave in the drought in the springtime, the young of the year, they're not making it back. And at least in Mill and Deer Creek, they're not making it back. So if we want these animals into the long-term future, this yearling strategy is the climate resilient strategy. And so we really need to focus on preserving this cold water refuge for them and other salmon. Similarly, again, with this kind of the bell distribution, so the yearlings are important for this kind of drought resiliency strategy. These fry, their job, like all salmon have a job and they are really amazing at spreading risk in space and time. And these fry, they're the scouts. They're the first ones to leave the river to find non natal living habitat downstream. And historically, these floodplains that were available in the Central Valley were really critical for this, um, these wet year, this really food production system. And what we see now is even the remnant floodplains that we have today. So I understand that you guys got a tour of the Yolo bypass and the Sutter bypasses on your previous kind of migration upstream here. Um, these are the data from, from this kind of this work. So what I'm showing you here are data from eye lens isotopes from winter run adults, carcasses. And we use those to, to tell the diet story of salmon over their lifetimes. So each one of these is a, a sulfur isotope value for winter ranching of salmon that spawned in these three years. And in yellow are these reduced sulfur values, which are indicative of floodplain rearing. We know that when the wheat, when sorry, when the rice is being um, decomposing, that these microbes um, actually fractionate sulfur. And so just like in wetland habitats, we see this reduced sulfur. And so these winter mention of salmon that are spawning, when you look back in time for what they did when they were little, even when they had very little floodplain opportunities, so whoops, goodness. Oh, cute. Okay, the point is the top one, note to self, the future speakers. And this is the opportunities for floodplain rearing on the yellow and silver bypass. And so it varies. Some years they have a lot of opportunities, but even in years when they don't have opportunities, the floodplains and those resources are incredibly important for these fish. You haven't seen our, our student Miranda Bell Telfock was on Science Friday talking about the island's isotope work. It's a must watch if you haven't listened to it yet. Okay, so centering on our winter range of salmon, you guys um, were on the tour. You know that they are relegated to spawning in one population down here downstream of Keswick Dam. Um, that's not where they historically spawned. They historically spawned in these cold, stable, spring fed systems in the upper watershed here. We're seeing a little bit of success with our jumpstart program and reestablishing winter run on Battle Creek. But this is their historical habitat. When Shasta Dam went in, it had multiple effects. It not only um, displaced the minimum, flooded their villages, and inundated a lot of their sacred sites. It displaced salmon from that watershed, which are incredibly intricately connected to the tribe, their spiritual connection. Hopefully, Chief Sisk has an opportunity to talk more about this tomorrow. Um, but um, the fact that the salmon were also um, blocked from this waterway um, means that we are now basically putting all of our eggs in this one basket, which makes them very vulnerable from a viability perspective. And we, when the winter run of salmon were enlisted in the early 90s, it was because the eggs, we weren't able to provide enough cold water to their eggs. And we're trying to pretend to be the McLeod when we operate the reservoir, right? The McLeod is cold, spring-fed, water that nourishes those eggs without any intervention. Right now, what we're doing since they can't get there is we are doling out that water and trying to make their eggs persist on that valley floor. 
we thought we could have an engineering solution and I wish that we did. <laughs> that temperature control device had held so much promise the way that we all like, oh, maybe the engineers will fix, fix this in our threat evolutionary, threat evolution way that we operate. But I'm here to tell you that it hasn't. This is the data from 2014, and this is work that Eric Danner's team does, but this is the temperature in 2014, even though we have the temperature control device, and we lost cold water. The eggs that were laid for winter run um, ended up um, perishing. And this is the temperature in the macaw, right? So this is what the river would have provided those eggs, um, and we weren't able to provide that for them. This is a thermal profile, and um, this is a Keswick Dam in downstream on the y-axis, so the distance from the dam. This is the, the months of the year, and this is the water temperature. Red means it's very hot. And this is where the eggs are laid and kind of the emergence time. And you can see that we lost cold water here. And so all of those winter run eggs um, do not uh, persist. I'm mentioning this just because we have so much singular focus on winter run of salmon, but uh, fall run matter too for any of you who love to eat salmon in the ocean like I do and to catch them. This is what fall run looked like that year. We don't actually really manage temperatures for fall run um, yet. Um, and you can see here that they were the big one of the bigger losers in that loss of cold water. And you can't just manage from a single species perspective because a lot of us care a lot about fall run spawning on the main stem. Um, Laura asked me to share a conceptual model that we developed. Um, primarily, it was to, to improve our monitoring that, that was needed for our winter run life cycle model. This conceptual model, I think, is still really useful. Um, the yellow um, stars are areas where there, there are management knobs that we can control. And you can think about these landscape attributes that influence these environmental drivers, that then influence the habitat attributes, that then influence kind of fish responses. I bring this up here in the context of um, how water temperature touches on so many different things. Water temperature can influence predation risk and metabolic rates of predation, can influence disease, can influence red quality through whether or not you actually are providing enough cold water to these okay. um, interactions between all of these. Um, and we were primarily focusing on what we needed to measure in the fish responses here. Um, but in all of these hypotheses, it's in the Wendell, Wendell et al. paper. You guys might have that in your packets. And you can look at the submodels across the landscape to look at any of those you know, you're interested in. I was interested, as somebody who is interested in life history diversity, teaming with Eric's team when I saw these data. So this is 2021 and 2022. And again, these are the sizes of the number of eggs that are laid in space and time. So you can see that this is the distance below Keswick Dam. And this is over the season. And the colors are now the probability of temperature dependent mortality. One of the patterns you can see is that the later in the season you get, the higher the temperature dependent mortality in 2021. And similarly, the farther downstream you go, the more vulnerable you are. So like this is this is the best place to be if you are red. And you can see that in this year um, is a worse year than 2022 as it relates to temperature dependent mortality. So I was interested in whether or not we're seeing selection for who females that spawn early and high, whether or not their progeny have a disproportionate chance of surviving. So we ended up looking at the odalus collected from juvenile mortalities at Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Thank you, Bill Poitras and your team. Um, under a project that's funded by Reclamation, thank you, Josh Israel, um, to be able to look at the hatch date distribution of the juveniles that are surviving to Red Bluff Diversion Dam. And the odalus allows us to back populate their hatch dates. So this is kind of a hatch date distribution of fish that uh, a heuristic description of um, fish um, hatch day distribution. And you can compare that to where the eggs are spawned and the degree day projection of when they would hatch. And if you compare those two, that will give you a sense of the strength of selection based on hatch date or spawn date. So this is what we found. In 2021 and 2022, you can see that we see um, that earlier spawners are more represented in the juveniles that we see at Red Left Diversion Dam and the later spawners are less represented in what we're observing. And we are just next week going to UCLA to continue our work looking at the oxygen isotopes of those same individuals to see if we can relate the temperature they, they experience with their representation in the juveniles. So this is just kind of ongoing work that we're looking at to try to tease out all of those complicated hypotheses related to how temperature influences this egg to fry life stage. Okay. I've kind of moving along our map, I've covered these three topics. I'm now going to focus on the hatcheries and some of the work that we're doing in the 
So as part of the viability analysis, so let's just be clear, winter winter of salmon will always be endangered if they're in a single population spawning outside of their historic distribution. If they remain there, they are at endangered. Um, but there are other metrics that we want to see moving in the right direction, right? So these are other viability criteria that we look at. And if you look at hatchery influence from 2020 to 2010, these are five-year assessments to the 2020 assessment. You now see that there's a high risk of extinction due to the hatchery influence. And this is because there's a lot of modeling um, that shows that the role of domestication selection when they spawn with wild populations can be out of balance. And so you want to make sure that your proportion of natural influence in your populations are still being driven by natural selection and not what's happening in the hatchery. And um, living Stone National Fish Hatchery is about best management practices. And you can see here that if you have um, over 20% of hatchery fish spawning in the wild, you're starting to move in the wrong direction. You're starting to see potentially the role of domestication selection in your wild populations and affects fitness, right? It affects the ability of those, the production systems in winter time. And so what you can see here over time is that we're relying more and more on the hatchery. And we are really out of balance with the, the number of hatchery fish that are spawning in the wild over time. And I just want to point this out because we often are just tracking when you run a statement without looking at the number of wild fish. But that same drought year that I showed you, that 2014 and 2015, where we lost cold water um, abilities, only 124 wild fish came back to spawn that year in 2017. That's not a lot of fish. That is a, there's a very few wild fish survived that to come back. The next year, 430. So these are low numbers for already a population that's really low. But I just want to make sure that we're all kind of looking at this together, that these are the numbers that we're um, confronting with, with winter run, and that the hatchery, while it is demographically rescuing fish in drought, um, it, it for sure is moving in the wrong direction, the fact that we need to rely on them so much in our drought. Okay, I'm going to add one more plot twist because Laura asked me to talk a little bit about this, which is as though salmon in winter run didn't have enough stressors, death by a thousand cuts, a new one showed up in 2020 which is thymine deficiency. So you think that the ocean would provide salmon with everything that they need. It turns out that that is a false assumption and that um, winter run Chinook salmon were not getting enough vitamin B1 to pass onto their progeny. And so what we observed was um, a lot of mortality across our hatcheries. We thought it was a disease outbreak. It turns out that when you actually put those fish that are behaving not like the fish in the top, but behaving in this behavior down here where they're lethargic, swimming on their sides and corkscrewing. If you put them in water with vitamin B1, I call them the Jesus fish. Like they resurrect themselves. They, they shake it off and they act like these fish in the top. So that was the first indication that thymine deficiency was a new stressor to our system. We It has direct mortality effects, but it also causes birth defects. So things that look masked, like they look like maybe they're healthy fish, but there's latent effects to their immune system and their, um, yeah, disease, to their susceptibility to diseases. We have an inter international and interagency team working on this that I lead um, that is a great um, resource. And I'm just going to highlight a few questions about that. I'm happy to talk about it later. This is something that is just really on point with the way that we think about um, temperature and management of Shasta. What I'm showing you here is the egg climbing concentration of the different runs of salmon over time. So this is most recent, and this is the, when we first started measuring it. The proportion of females that have critically low levels of egg climbing all the way to healthy levels in gray. And what you can see here is that, um, and and well, what you can see here is that it's not going away. The ocean has not rearranged itself, and that anchovies, which we think is the proximate cause of the singular diet item, not a diverse diet that has thymine ace that breaks down thymine in consumers, is to cause is to grow. Coincident or in parallel to that, we stood up this work looking at the relationship between egg thymine concentrations and survival in adults sorry, and survival in their progeny. So now we can relate the concentrations of egg climbing to population level mortality rates. So for winter runs of salmon, we know that we're increasing the impact of climbing dependent mortality. 50% of winter run eggs that are laid in the river are dying because they don't have enough of the right vitamins, which is a non-trivial impact, demographic impact to this endangered fish. Um, we are integrating climbing dependent mortality with our temperature dependent mortality as we think about the number of juveniles we're expecting to pass red blood diversion dam in a given year. And this is like a multiplicative um, interaction. At least that's how we're thinking about it, which is if you have eggs in the red and you kill some of them because you don't give them the right temperature and some of them didn't have the right nutrition, that is a multiplicative um, 
way of thinking about the role of these stressors. And there might even be interactions that could even exacerbate it. Okay. I'm going to end with just talking about in 2022, during the third year of a consecutive drought, um, the California Department of Fish and Game, NOAA Fisheries, and the Winnemuntu Tribe, with our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners, um, all um, gathered together to reintroduce Winter Run to the McLeod River, which is a huge hope spot on the landscape. Um, it is one of the fav my favorite things that I do. I've been monitoring extinction of winter run chinook salmon in high definition in high definition science for a large part of my 20 years of studying salmon. And this is definitely a shining spot on the landscape. Um, I want to mention that one of the amazing things that has come from this in terms of monitoring the salmon in the system is that we've seen the emergence of the yearling life history stage after the first year of doing it. This high giving fish access to this cold high elevation habitat um, has already given rise to yearlings, which are these drought resilient um, life history strategies that are pretty rare in the landscape. So it's pretty exciting. Okay. To summarize, um, again, this without the habitat, the salmon themselves lose their selective landscape to behave the way that we know them to behave. Um, dams have altered the out migration diversity that historically helped salmon cope with mega floods and mega droughts. So making sure that we are allowing for that full support of that expression of life history diversity is important. Um, I've basically shown you that the eggs are on life support. Eric's gonna talk more about that. I'm just gonna make a plug and just say that I think it's incredibly important to get this right, to actually know this temperature by which it's the edge of the cliff in this nonlinear way that you're approaching. I would offer we should never manage to what we learn biologically is that temperature. We should take like 40 steps back and see where the cliff edge is because it is a nonlinear relationship. And so that's my soapbox for not managing to what the answer is. Um, and I and I look at Jay because I'm like, oh, he's such an optimization model. Like everybody wants just to know what the singular solution is because water is precious and we need it to go everywhere. But I just, we need to back away from the cliff. Um, and then the hatchery is not a long-term solution for a winter run. Um, and then again, the cold water in the McLeod is what the winter run needs. It is what a lot of the salmon, salmon are cold water fish. They need that cold water. We should be doing everything we can to get fish back to the cold water as cold water refuges. The emergence of this yearling is a real um, positive hope spot. And then lastly, um, um, Eric's now going to transition and talk about the work we've been doing on the life cycle model um, in order to kind of integrate across the life cycle in order to um, help support some of the decision tools with California salmon and water. Get away. Thank you. How's that? Oh, yeah. It's okay. I tend to talk quite loudly, so I will try not to blast everybody's ears on this. Um, so we just need to share it with people on Zoom. Well, that was a, a, a great uh, uh, introduction for what I'm going to talk about uh, from, from Rachel here. And uh, my presentation starts, I'll just jump ahead a little bit with um, with a focus on the complexity of the salmon life cycle and the complexity of water management in California and how important the, the two of those are and how interrelated the two of those are and how problematic that is. Go so ahead. Mm -hmm. Is it into delay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, here we go. <laughs> Can that go away? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, I'll. Uh, I'll ignore it myself. So on the left is salmon life cycle. Uh, very complex. Many different life stages. Many different habitats. Many different stressors can affect them in those different habitats at those different life stages. And on the right is the Central Valley, or a depiction of water management in California. Also very complex. 
And so, for example, for the, uh, the egg stage in salmon, mortality at that stage can propagate through the life cycle. And what happens at, at Shasta Dam up here affects the, the egg stage in the salmon. And management at Shasta, how Shasta's managed, can propagate through the Central Valley. And that's more of a topic for, for Tom and Randy to talk about. But Shasta is a big gun in the system. It, the effects can reverberate throughout the system. So this is a problem. You have a complex life cycle and you have complex water management. They're highly interrelated and that makes for difficult decision making. And just recently um, I was asked and probably has to do with uh, with all the work going on currently, but what, you know, how important is, is temperature dependent egg mortality ultimately to the, the salmon uh, population dynamics? And it's a really interesting and important question. I mean, it's an important scientific question. You want to know what those effects are on later life stages. But it also struck me as a really interesting question that this is an endangered species that is already on the brink. And we're wondering how important mortality at one life stage would be. And it's the one life stage that we actually do have models for evaluating operations, effects of operations on mortality. And so why is that even a question? Um, so it, it sort of, it, it, that captures the essence of how important water is from Shasta and important when water is needed for Shasta for many other system uses. And I wanna be clear that when I talk about other system objectives, I'm trying to be as value neutral about it. I recognize there are many other important legitimate needs for that water. My concern is that we effectively evaluate all the trade-offs and are clear about uh, uh, what our options are. So I will move on to this decision uh, support framework. This is sort of just a, a simplified view of, of how we're approaching this. Um, they're the individual elements, all the science that goes into, into this. Experiments, monitoring models, conceptual mathematical simulation models, et cetera. And all those are important and need to continue um, but they also need to be integrated in step two. So what do collectively do they tell us about the questions that we're interested in? And they need to be quantified so we can evaluate the trade-offs. And then the third part, I'll, I'll finish my talk by talking about this, the idea of the decision space, this unconstrained view of all the management options that we've had at our disposal. And then I'll just briefly touch on the idea of adaptive management and that in this in Central Valley, Planning, long-term planning and actual operations are two different things. And, and the, the operators know more about this than I do, but you know, you, you can have a long-term plan, but operations are going to be very different because conditions change, et cetera. And then we need to monitor the fish response relative to how operations actually occur and not based on what we propose to do. So um, starting with, with egg survival or Egg to fry survival. Um, this, these are these screw traps at, at the Red Bluff Diversion Dam. And so this figure up here, I think Steve Lindley uh, talked about this earlier on in one of your previous meetings. This is the egg to fry survival estimates over time in those points there. And it's highly variable as you would expect in the natural population. But during the droughts of, I think it was 14 and 15, we noticed that, that the the variability in the egg to fry survival track temperature, water temperatures pretty closely. But when you model, when you fit a model to the laboratory studies on, on temperature sensitivity and apply that to what the actual exposures were, there was no relationship. So judge, going with the, the critical temperatures that were used as targets for, for managing the system, that didn't explain this, this egg to fry uh, survival at all, essentially. And so we uh, published a series of papers, um, Martin et al, uh, 2018 and 2020, that came up with a, uh, a model for explaining that temperature, a temperature dependent mortality. This is the, uh, the original version here, the lab driven, and this would be the, the relationship according to the, the what we now call the NIMS, a temp temperature dependent mortality model, which much better tracks the, uh, the the egg to fry survival, and this is because eggs are have this this membrane that um, 
protects them, but also limits the amount of oxygen that they can get in inside the egg. And then egg, salmon eggs are relatively large. And demand goes up exponentially with temperature. And it also goes up with uh, live tissue mass within the egg. And at some point, when the demand exceeds the supply, and the supply is driven by the velocity of the water as it comes to the egg. So this is a very localized velocity. This is the interstitial velocity. Eggs don't care about the velocity anywhere, but immediately around them. They can't, they can't behaviorally thermoregulate. They can't move to another location. Once they're fertilized, they're stuck there. And so the dissolved oxygen that is coming in the water immediately to them is what matters. And then as it diffuses across that membrane, if the water velocity is not fast enough to replace the, the deoxygenated water, then that, that starts to limit the supply. So, um, so this is, yeah, this is an issue uh, for, for winter running. And then going back to this question about what is the effect of, of egg uh, temperature, temperature dependent egg mortality later in the population. This is a graph of cohort replacement rate over time, but it's it's backed up three years so that the color of these point, sorry, the color of these dots represents egg mortality, uh, egg temperature dependent mortality in that, sorry, in that year. But the uh, the y-axis over here is the log cohort replacement rate for the adults returning three years later. And the, the, the uh, a cohort replacement rate of one, which would be zero on this log scale, means if say you had a thousand adults that, um, uh, that returned from the thousand adults three years earlier, you would have a cohort replacement rate of one. You want it to be above one for the population to grow. If it's below one, the population is going to decline. So you can see all the years with, with high temperature dependent egg mortality all have the uh, uh, total replacement rates three years later that are well below one. So this is an effect that is carrying on through the population, propagating through the population. Fine. This is the uh, the egg to fry survival plotted in black over that same that same time series uh, with the, the percent survival on this axis. And so that is obviously carried through to the cohort replacement rate as well. And then finally, this is what we would predict the egg to fry survival be, would be from our egg uh, temperature dependent mortality uh, model. So you can see these, these patterns are uh, a pretty strong time. And then uh, another point I'd like to make here is um, that the, the contraction of the thermally protected habitat over time. So this is this is um, a map of the river going from uh, Keswick up here all the way down to Red Bluff. And this is where the temperature compliant point was in 1996. And that is the point at which they target the cold water in operations to try and make it that far downstream. And this is where the temperature compliance point is today. So this is about 40 miles to this point, and it's about five miles to that point. So it's 10% of the distance that it was in 1996. And um, it's uh, and it's still at this point uh, in 2024. And this is, uh, I threw this up here for reference. This is uh, the, the Sacramento area um, or Sacramento Valley mean air temperature between, I think it's June and September uh, over that same time period. And you can see uh, it's it's clearly warming, warming, which is really problematic. And as you heard yesterday, the, the reservoir is almost full, but the amount of cold water in the reservoir is significantly lower than it has been in previous years. So all this together, is not painting a very positive picture when this is the amount of habitat we're currently protecting, and it'll be challenging to meet that goal for the whole summer, for the whole reservoir. And I, and I hope I have a hopeful ending to my uh, presentation like Rachel here. I'm trying to think if I can end on a, on a high note, and I think I can. Um, let's see here. This is a depiction, this, it's the same information 
this the, the bars represent the, the compliance point distance. We want to reverse y axis so the dam, because the dam's up here and we're moving downstream. That's the compliance distance over time in the blue bars. The individual dots are the red locations, and the colors of the dots are the A country dependent mortality. So you can see typically in the past, it's been the, the downstream reds where water's warmed up more and they're more likely to suffer uh, mortality that, that, that hit. And then these are the really bad drought years where, where there was significant, if not near total mortality. Um, and then that's the air temperature plotted uh, there as well. And everything together on one graph. I just put it this in here so you guys have this reference. For further discussion, you can see how everything lines up um, with the addition of temperature dependent egg mortality here and May reservoir storage here, which they're strong, correlated as you guess. All right, moving on. Now I'm going to talk a bit about our uh, our physical modeling. This is uh, the Central Valley Temperature Mapping and Prediction, or CB Temp. It's a website. I forgot to put the website link up here. But this allows you to look through the different panels here, starting with a watershed model uh, for inputs into the reservoir, a reservoir model, river model that includes river temperature, and models of a temperature-dependent mortality. Meteorology, you can download the data, you can look at uh, historic data, et cetera. Um, the watershed model, we use input from the California River uh, uh, Nevada River Forecast Center, and then we use a historic temperature. Um, uh, uh, we use historic data for the input temperature. We're working on a combination of VIC and RBM to get better predictive uh, models for input temperatures based on climate change. We just haven't uh, we haven't finished that work yet. For the reservoir, we use CE12W2. For the river, we use RAF, a river assessment for forecasting temperature that we developed many years ago, and then. The meteorology depends uh, for dry release models depends on what mode we're using, if it's high impact mode, if it's forecast mode, long term, etc. So let's start here with the reservoir conditions. Here's a, a reservoir profile over time. These represent the TCB temperature control device gates at the different elevations. And then the, the shading represents how many of the gates are open at each one of those elevations. So you can see how the system is being operated in order to blend water from the different elevations at the time. So this, over the course of a season, this would be updating up to that date. And then you'd know what the hindcast looks like and then there would be forecast mode. And this down here would show how closely uh, you are to uh, the predictions are to what the vertical profile observations are. Um, then for the river, depending on what's released from, from Teswick, this would track that downstream. Again, we're going from uh, the dam downstream, water heats up in the summer as it's moving downstream. You can put different uh, 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 ISO lines on here for different temperatures to, to more easily isolate like where the, the um, critical temperature might be that you're trying to target. You can put different, um, these are all buttons you can click on the website. You can put uh, different, uh, uh, geographic location lines on here. And then you can also put uh, points up there that will show where the egg location or the red locations are based on their surveys. I'll show that in the next slide. <clears throat> now we switch over. This is no longer temperature. This is egg. This is a prediction of what the egg temperature dependent mortality would be based on these temperatures. And so blue would be high uh, probability of survival, red would be high probability mortality. I think this ISO line here is like 90% survival. This is from 2020, so I just grabbed this screenshot. And those are where the egg locations were. So you can see most of these eggs were pretty well protected that year. Maybe the, the tail end, which is typically the, the, the reds in the later part of the season are the most vulnerable because that's when they start running out of, the, of cold water. So this, the, the CB temp is mostly a, for evaluating proposed operations on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation comes up with a, uh, an operational forecast. We run it through our models, we present it, and it can be used for decision making. But we were interested in exploring a much broader range of options, including all the variable hydroclimate, all the different ways of operating the TCB, 
all the different hydro, uh, or, sorry to mention that, all the hydro climate inputs, all the different temperature compliance targets downstream, the ways of shaping that, the window of operations, it ends up with this combinatorial explosion of all these different uh, options that becomes very computationally intensive if you run it through all these previous models. So um, we developed the, I don't think this is actually the current title, but the Rapid Assessment Temperature Modeling Framework that uses simpler models at all those stages um, to, to evaluate sort of an exploratory mode of all these things. And it can run a full couple forecasts uh, over an entire year in 10 seconds or less. So you can go through thousands of different, different iterations to, to identify potential operating scenarios that we could then run through the more computationally expensive models. So this has been a really useful tool, especially during the drought when, when we were trying to look at, at what our, our limited options were. Oh, and um, this is one of the things that we explored um, I threw this in here at the last minute. And when I first started on this work, there was this, um, this focus on releasing more water in order to, uh, in order to carry that thermal mass downstream to, to, uh, to protect downstream reds. You need to have more water that's moving faster and heats up less quickly, it's deeper, et cetera. But we actually ran this through a sensitivity analysis and found that if you if you break the, the the river, Sacramento River, up into these regions here, all the all the uh, the reds, winter red and reds, up here, are actually way up here, but they're in this first reach here. And short story is that this reach is is entirely affected by the release temperature. Release volume has has very little effect on the river temperature at this first reach because it hasn't had a chance to really. The heat exchange hasn't occurred over this short distance, so it's, it's really driven by the release temperature. And this is part of the cold water pool issue that we are all here to talk about. And that the resource that matters the most is the amount of cold water in, in the reservoir. And that's what uh, drives the temperatures with that first reach. Uh, as you go further downstream, other factors take over, air temperature becomes more important, et cetera. Uh, so it's not just about water temperature. Um, Rachel talked about the change in the hydrograph. These are, this is an example from Ben Bridge before the dam building period would be the blue here. So most of the flow was in the winter and springtime. That's the more natural hydrograph here. And of course that has changed over time as we have uh, stored more water and diverted it to places and times when we need it. And so this is the more recent hydrograph here from 1987 to 2022 in red there. And that is very important for outmigrating the juvenile salmon that used to take advantage of these flows here that are now significantly, significantly lower. Um, we have a, a acoustic uh, telemetry program that well, we have been tracking uh, thanks to funding from USBR. We've been tracking juvenile smolts. We can't track fry, they're too small for acoustic tags, but we can track smolts. I encourage you to check out this website. Um, but here's an example of winter run under different water conditions. The, the blue would be wet years. The, um, there's a few light blue below normal years. Um, orange or yellow would be dry years and red critically dry years. But you can see that the, the flows associated with those water year types can have a, an important uh, impact on out migration survival, which is overall very low, especially in in these uh, in these dry years. This is reading up here, and this is ocean somewhere close to ocean. I'm not sure where the exact last receiver location is, but um, you know we're talking three uh, percent survival. So. You got to get through the temperature part, but then you also have to have that migration flows. And in some cases, we're talking about trade-offs here because water that's needed to stay in the reservoir for temperature the following summer is the same water that you might need for these out migration flows. So in case I haven't made this clear, this is all about trade-offs, trade-offs between a single run of salmon, between different runs of salmon, between 
different uh, uh, objectives for the water, hydropower, you guys, uh, you guys know the story. Uh, oh, and this is some work by Cyril Michelle in the lab that shows these thresholds for uh, out migration survival based on based on flow. All right, so uh, I think I'm using up my time quickly. I'll, I'll try and go through the rest of this pretty quickly. Integrated models. Um, so quantitative life cycle models are, are in my view, really the, the key here because they can evaluate the long-term population dynamics and integrate across all the life stages, across environmental conditions. They can uh, integrate new information as that becomes available. And they're great for measuring these trade-offs and potential synergy between different operating options. Um, the winter run life cycle model, uh, this is a, a, a complicated model that could easily uh, take an hour of your time by someone who's more knowledgeable than me talking about it, but it's a, it is a stage structured stochastic life cycle model, but it's actually many models built together uh, that are linked together, habitat models, um, and it is based on calcium. It was designed that way intentionally to evaluate the effects of water operations on this endangered species. But it can capture all of these important, the four H's, hydrology, the water operations, hatchery effects, habitat restoration. So how uh, potentially new habitat restoration projects will impact the life cycle harvest, reintroduction, and it, it provides important uh, management metrics, cohort replacement rate, uh, uh, adult abundance, small production rates, et cetera. It's, um, it's fairly broad geographically, and this is necessary because if, if you break it down into too many uh, components, it becomes too computationally uh, uh, complex, but um, upper river, lower river, yellow bypass, delta, bay, uh, gulf and ocean, um, the, the water flow affects the quantity and quality of habitat in each of these different locations, and flow affects the survival of smolts in all these locations. And, um, and all of them are represented in the model framework here, which is which, which are the, the, the mathematical equations, the transition probabilities between each of these stages here. And this is all uh, this is all available in that in that. Uh, technical memo so you can dive into the details as, as much as you'd like. Um, all right, so let me let me finish with this last part, which is uh, involves this concept of the decision space. Um, this is a project that I'm involved with that um, it involves uh, um, uh, making, making water management um, uh, model data more available to the public. This isn't a promotion of that project as much as it's a promotion of the concept of what that project is going to provide, which is um, which is a, a data dashboard that allows uh, all users to access all the calcium results for a broad range of, of modeling efforts that we are going to make um, uh, available to, to anybody. And here, uh, it's easier to explain this diagram here. So we will we will examine a whole series of hydroclimate futures that are, done, that are being done by uh, folks at UC San Diego. There's something like seven different university partners on this project, and then we will have a whole range of operational scenarios that we are going to all the knobs and levers that you can turn in calcium, but unconstrained by any of the uh, any of the uh, restrictions associated with with water rights, with environmental concerns, with, with anything. This is a purely scientific effort to look at the entire range of what could be done with water management in California. And those, those, will, uh, those two coupled together will provide a single water allocation scenario. So one hydroclimate, one operation scenario. And you do in that same hydroclimate with some different operation scenario. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, to where the point we have um, this library built up of, of possibly a thousand different scenarios that is searchable by by operating scenario objective by location what have you, and then those for each of those we'll run those through the, the we'll run the winter life cycle model on each of those. So then you have this whole range of the winter run population effects of all of those scenarios. 
We're also doing it for drinking water, for delta salinity, et cetera. That's all part of the co-equal project. But the idea is that those data would then be available to folks that have, say, what are the impacts of hydropower generation? They would have the calcium data in order to run their own models, economic models on the impacts for agriculture, et cetera. All of that, these data would be available, and then hopefully people would use those and put those results back into this database so that there's a database out there that everybody can use to evaluate the trade-off between water management and your objective of the uh, All right, so finishing up here, then the idea is to build this framework for assessing the impacts of water operations on endangered salmon, which is what my goal is, but many other objectives. The more objectives you can evaluate, the better the decision-making tool will be. It's independent of policy constraints, what I mentioned earlier. It's independent of specific fishery management goals. It's not like we're trying to meet some specific goal. We're trying to have a model that will provide all the data so you can evaluate whichever goal you're interested in. Open and transparent, all that data would be available. The model code would be available, the results. And when I say accessible to the public, I don't just mean yeah, website, but ideally the results are translated into terms that are more uh, uh, understandable to the lay person because that's really, uh, it's really important if, if people don't understand it and don't know what you're doing, it's not going to be nearly as effective. It's scalable and expandable. All right, I'm going to finish here with uh, way too many slides, but I, I don't mean to insult your intelligence with how simple I'm making this, it's the only way I can get through it without bungling it. So uh, keep that in mind as I'm going through this. So here's a conceptual model of some fish objective improving on the Y axis, some other uh, system objective, what it could be deliveries, it could be any anything, deliveries to a particular, uh, uh, for a particular user, et cetera, improving on that axis. We don't want to be down here. This is lose lose. We want to be up here. Probably unrealistic, at least for winter run and most uh, many of the other system objectives, because they're directly in competition for water. Um, yeah. What does the rest of this decision space look like? And this is an unknown at this point. So once we built this library that I referred to in the previous slide, we have the potential to fill as much of this decision space as we can. And an example might be if you just had three scenarios that say, and this is entirely hypothetical, my axes are hypothetical, so I guess I don't really need to say that, but some system objective against some fish objective. If you only have those three options, you don't know what the, and don't know what the full space would be. What if this was in fact the full decision space? And those three options there would then no longer be optimal by any standard. And that with that decision space, you can create this efficiency frontier. And for this one, for example, you could improve all your system uh, objectives here with no cost to the fish objective. Or on this axis, you could improve your fish, fish objective with no cost to the system objective, or some combination of the two would, would move in that direction. This isn't which one to pick. It's not a scientific question. It's a policy question. But, but the, the decision makers, the policy folks, should really have that entire frontier to look at, not just the three red dots. Um, and obviously, you know, that where you are on this curve can, can have a big influence on, on the, uh, the trade offs, and that, you know, this distance here and this distance here are the same for the system objective, but the fish benefit is significant. So finally, um, because of the library would have so many different um, uh, iterations of, of, of different climate objectives, et cetera, you might have one efficiency frontier here for one, one climate, say this is the current, uh, current operations or, or operations under the current climate, but this might be the shift in that frontier under some dry or warm future. And then on a positive note, this is what this is what the combination of say reintroduction and other uh, other management actions might shift the efficiency frontier up 
in the direction that we wanted to. Point being that we would need all of this in in a tool that we can evaluate the approach. So finally, this is my last slide. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, water planning and water operations are, are two different are two different things, and that if we really need to monitor whatever uh, whatever objectives we agree upon over time to see that they they uh, they they match up with with operations. And I, ideally, this is something that could be done in, in real time. And I'm finally done, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rachel. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> so that was quite an achievement to cover that, that amount of space in such a short time. So I'm sure there's going to be uh, you know, lots of questions. So. Um, yeah, uh, so perhaps with the committee, if you could keep your questions succinct so we can get to as many as possible in the next 20 minutes. Um, sh should we start with Steve and then go to Fedra and work our way along the, the line? Well, thanks, Rachel and Eric, for an uh, excellent presentation. I know it's very, uh, yeah, thanks for yeah, thanks for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, we're summarizing one. Complex information. I think there's a lot out. I can listen to you guys all the time. So, I have a general question about the influence of temperature on other life stages of the sample. And something put into the back of the Oregon, they adopted temperature as a formal part of the um, of water quality standards. And uh, they basically made temperature as a TMDL for the maximum load, and that any permit. Will be approved to make sure it doesn't change the water temperature by any certain amount of two degrees or something like that. Uh, it's been going out for over a decade. Like that. But it's based largely on uh, salmon and largely on migration corridors. But so looking at a different life stage in here, we're looking at migration of Belskin and what the small county. Is there any operation or standard or concern or interest? Other life stages that we have to think about. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we've been thinking a lot about the role of temperature given climate change, and some work that Stuart Munch and our team did really does showcase that in cold, wet springs, we actually see the out migration phenology um, expand. And when you don't have that cold seasonal landscape scale input to salmon as they out migrate, it's much more contracted. So there is this really important kind of meteorologic component to the phenology of salmon. And we've been thinking most of it in the terms of um, work that Cyril Michelle and our team has also done looking at the, the, the date that the Delta turns 20 degrees, which is like this nonlinear threshold where it's like, wow, those non-native fishes, their metabolism turns on and they're voracious feeders on salmon. And it's also the temperature where physiologically salmon don't do very well. So it's like this perfect storm. And so you can actually track in kind of climate modeling scenarios where that date is predicted to be. And that also kind of shuts off the Delta and the out migration quarter of the salmon. So there's for sure um, big impacts to temperature at different life stages and out migration stages. The extent to which we have controls over those are a little bit more, um, that, that's not my wheelhouse, but for sure, um, salmon respond at different life stages to what those temperature um, thresholds present themselves to be. Just a, a quick follow-up is a really good question. And um, uh, I, I guess the one, the, the points I would make, A, was we have the most definitive data on the egg stage and we have trouble meeting that criteria when it's so much easier to achieve in terms of closest to the dam and and there's the least amount of uh, heat exchange that occurs for the later life stages further downstream so that that's one one sort of negative uh, perspective uh, the other is that again that would be a, a perfect uh, 
example of, of evaluating the potential trade-offs between trying to predict later life stages versus egg life stages. And then finally, other, other species, um, there's potentially trade-offs between what's optimal for winter run egg and cold water for winter run egg protection versus uh, warmer water, which would, would be better for uh, for, uh, green, for uh, endangered green sturgeon development. And those may be somewhat at odds with each other. So there's another another trade off to evaluate. Okay. I have one follow up. Uh, the, uh, so there's no operational considerations of later other life stages. Sorry, mm -hmm. well. Sure. Chief, you. <laughs> the question is, yeah, the question, uh, are we aware of any operational target, temperature targets for other life stages? And uh, I'm funny, I'm looking at Josh Israel trying to see if he has an answer, but I honestly don't have an answer for you. But Josh, we can turn to you in the session later to just pick up on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to echo pretty much what Steve said. And I have two sort of mechanical questions, one for each and one um, for Eric. So the first one is, what will happen to the smoke that will be produced as a result of spawning in the cloud? How will they, how will they be handled in this like plan? And then um, the second one was, what? how was the decision made to make the temperature control of each change from 40 miles to five miles. Is that a policy decision or is that based on where the vents are? Would like to take that one? The first one that was directed to me. So the way that the macabre introduction work currently is um, is functioning is that the juveniles that uh, the, the eggs are raised on um, streamside in this near nature based system, and then they volitionally go into a river, and then they're captured at a downstream collection to downstream collection um, locations, and then they're transported down below um, Keswick Dam. And um, so that's the near term solution. So that's what we're doing now. We have aspirations and plans in place for a volitional passage that um, DWR has a contract and grant and working with the tribe on exploring. So hopefully in the future, it will be a volitional component. Right now, it is definitely assisted migration where they are spending a short amount of their three years of life in a truck um, going from one location to the other. Um, so I'm just going to also just take the time to go on my soapbox right now because nobody loves the idea of fishing trucks. Like there's no, no, nobody loves that um, for, oh, for obvious reasons because they're fishing trucks. Um, but other, that aside, um, I would also like to offer from like a interventive perspective, I feel that the hatchery and actually all the choices that are happening in hatcheries have a lot a bigger impact in terms of mate selection, in terms of feeding them in raceways, they're in, a, in an infrastructure for a lot longer, they're wilded for a shorter period of time. I would like to offer that a truck ride in the grand scheme of a salmon life is less interventive than a hatchery um, operation. Okay. And I will address the question about the uh, temperature compliance point location, which is a really good one and, and way oversimplified in my presentation. And, and you will see from the, the figure that shows the actual red locations uh, on top of the temperature compliance location, that, that bar graph, the, in many cases, the, the compliance point was much further downstream than, than where any reds were, or certainly the bulk of the reds, which you could make an argument that, you know, why are you targeting a temperature point where when there's very little, there are very few or no reds to, to uh, in that habitat, so that that's one um, that's one reason for moving the compliance point up. And this is not my area of expertise, and I and I should make it clear. Both Rachel and I are are with the Science Center of NOAA Fisheries. We're not with the policy um, branch, the regional branch. So we we do the science. We we are not in charge of policy, and so we try to not uh, step. We try to stay in our lanes on this. And so um, what the actual written policy of where that compliance point is, that's part of um, the biological opinion in, in various operating plans, et cetera. Um, I, I would say that my understanding of the language is it's, it's something along the lines of we will attempt to reach this point 
with the water that we have, the cold water that we have, and we'll move it upstream if we don't have that cold water. And I would like to say, stepping out of my, well, <laughs> stepping stepping into danger zone here and that the amount of cold water that's available is a policy decision. There are many other uses for that water, but at some point it is a policy decision. It's not just a, a function of a drought, it's a function of other uses of that water. And so that's where that, that decision space um, efficiency frontier would come in hand for helping uh, helping identify where that point would be based on on objectives, not on the sun. And I'm just going to stay in my lane, but also just mention that the biology of the fish might be exacerbating what we see, right? So like Eric showed that like the eggs that were farther downstream might have been selected against, right? So like spawning downstream with your salmon over time um, it is not an adaptive thing to do. And so also because the salmon um, home to their natal rivers and even at small spatial scales, you could generate that pattern alone for years where you actually um, have selected for spawning close to the dam. And then, then they just continue to behaviorally do that because they're going back to where they were born. So I don't know how to get that out of that pickle. They are now all in like the upper portions and I am unclear if you added water further downstream, how we break that cycle back into um, having them be in a less compressed habitat. Just a reminder, committee members, please speak directly into the mic. It's the ones that cannot hear our questions. And this is really so when uh, Eric, it was that very clear in the importance of the separation between the agencies that have been doing the science that's developed and the final policy. So, you cannot answer questions. And uh, so, I just want to know here. Thank you. Thanks for this excellent talk. Um, question for Eric. Um, can you talk about the sensitivity to the flow? Temperature and second, when it doesn't tell the mission temperature, also mentioned that the mechanism to complete the mission. So, does that make a sense of the question and how important this is the mechanism? So, yeah, thank you. Those are both uh, very good questions. Um, so the first one was uh, if the, the release volume was not important in that first reach, was release volume important in the, the, the downstream reaches? And it does become more important as you go further downstream. And then uh, the heat exchange, so air temperature becomes the driving factor as you go further down the stream. Um, not, not as the, the effect was not as significant as the release temperature uh, in that first reach. So, um, but it, it, it does, it, it sort of flips as you go further downstream, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of release flow uh, affecting the uh, Dang temperature dependent mortality. That that's another really good question, and that's an area that we are exploring more and more. And that the, the water velocity, the interstitial velocity within a red, can be affected by the overall river flow. Um, that uh, is variable by depth and a whole bunch of other factors that can make the the analysis uh, quite a bit more complicated. But ultimately, uh, is from all the exploration that we've done to this point. Temperature is still the bigger driver, and the, the increases in flow that would be required to offset increases in temperature are 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 so high that it's unlikely that that within that that's really a management knob that you could use to replace temperature. If that makes sense, um, it, it it does make the overall uh, operations a little bit more com complicated than that. Uh, previously, it, it was. Uh, or currently, our approach is that it's uh, it's you know, temperature just increases monotonically as you go downstream. So your probability of survival, egg survival, decreases as you go downstream. But now we're we're 
finding that it's it may be more depth dependent and that the deeper reds because the the, the water velocity at at the surface or at the bottom of the of the river it, it, you know it's uh parabolically decreasing so water velocity at the at the uh, red surface and the deep red is much lower than it would be at a shallow red which can affect the interstitial velocities so deeper reds may be more vulnerable than shallow reds these these deeper reds that they they spawn uh, up above or right below Fezwick, that's that's not natural spawning habitat for winter run they spawn in shallower fast flowing rivers or streams up above uh, the current dam location so it's a long-winded answer, but um, yeah, uh, we, we do believe it's ultimately it's more complicated than our current model is suggesting, but still temperatures. Okay. Well, there's time. We're going to take one more question. You know, probably still in and Renee and write uh, the question down, and we'll ask it. Yeah. If we have time at the end of this session, we'll come back to that. Thank you both for um, really informative presentation and clearly articulated um, information. I appreciate it. Um, just a clarifying question about this issue of egg mortality, I guess, on the hobbits question. Uh, I'm curious whether our understanding of egg mortality is related to that temperature and oxygen um, you know, interacting thresholds. Whether that's made on a holistic basis or whether we have a finer scale understanding, like how quickly is mortality being affected within the, I mean, egg mortality being affected in reds in response to things like episodic heat waves, or is this a cumulative effect that's occurring over the course of the season? Or do we have everything we need to know to be able to parse that out? That's a that's a really good question. I think we have, for management purposes, I think we have most of what we need to know. There's there's always more we 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 can we can learn about this. Um, I think Jim Anderson may be talking later today about the stage dependent mortality model that, that he's developed, and and this goes back to the uh, the important concept that that the um, demand goes up with live tissue mass within the egg, and so what what he would if he's going to be talking, he'll be talking about they are the most temperature sensitive at the pre hatch stage. And so um, they, they may be far less temperature sensitive earlier on in the egg development stage, but pre hatch, they may, may be very sensitive. And, and the reason that I don't think this has really significant management implications is that there's a, a broad temporal distribution of eggs within, within the, the incubate or within the spawning season. And it's very difficult to just manage for that one little window in which they might be sensitive. And the sensitivity is extremely high in that in that short window. So if you're off with your management target by half a degree or a degree, that could be it, that could be fatal. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's still a lot more to know, but um, uh, we're uh, the Bureau of Reclamation is, is starting a, a multi-year project on um, on addressing some of these questions, and, and we look forward to uh, working with USGS to, to address some of those. So we look forward to seeing what they uh, what they come up with. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Eric and Rachel, for the, the questions and such a simple presentations. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to continue, and if you'd like to say something up front, because there may be, we may get some of those questions uh, in a moment. So our next presentation is going to be on juvenile production estimate, and we really appreciate Dr. Michael O'Farrell being available at somewhat short notice, given the, the many other tasks. Is, uh, I think yeah, Michael's here. So Michael is a research fish biologist and program lead with the fisheries assessment modeling for NIMPS. Southwest Fisheries Science Center located in Santa Cruz. He's a member of the salmon assessment team and includes providing scientific support to salmon fishery management and performing research on salmon dynamics, assessment and ecology. He also serves on the Pacific Fishery Management Council salmon 
technical team, an advisory body that collectively performs stock assessments and work with fishery managers to plan seven fisheries on an annual basis. Uh, with collaborators, he performs annual stock assessments for the Klamath River Full Chinook, Sacramento River Full Chinook, and Sacramento River Winter Chinook Salmon. So Michael, thanks for being here today. Um, okay. Um, this is really outside my comfort zone <laughs> here. Uh, I, I do most of my work in the ocean uh, and uh, fishery management. But um, there was a chunk of time where we were working on uh, JPP, the juvenile prevention estimate, um, with some people um, who were in this room as well. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that work. Um, uh, disclaimer, I haven't been involved uh, with this for some time. Um, when we were working on this project, um, um, I would sit in on the meetings and um, participate in them. Um, since then, um, we've sort of turned over uh, what we did and um, there's been other people who have uh, you know, doing the JPE stuff for quite a, long, quite a while and they're, they're doing it now. And so I haven't been in the, uh, in the room uh, as this has happened. Uh, so that's my explain. I claim and everything on that. Um, okay. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about the JPE. Um, I'm assuming that people know very little about it. Um, I know there's probably going to be a range here, but in, in short, it's just a forecast of winter run juvenile um, entering the Sacramento uh, San Joaquin Delta. And um, this is important for uh, getting levels of incidental take um, at the state and federal pumping facilities. Um, there are uh, two calculations that are made, one for hatchery origin fish and one for natural origin fish, the different uh, uh, take level. Um, these, the JPE forecasts are developed by the IEP um, Interagency Ecological Programs Winter Run Project Work Team. Um, they do the calculations. I assume this is still the case. This is the way I remember it from before. Um, they do the calculations and they provide that information to uh, NIMS. And uh, then NIMS forwards it to um, BOR and, uh, and with the um, allowable take limits. Um, the JPE has changed over time. Um, there's been a number of different ways that um, people have addressed um, this issue. Um, and in particular, prior to 2015, I, I believe that um, one of the main things that was um, done prior to uh, that time was that we'd have a, a, an estimate of uh, spawning adults, and um, and then we try to estimate uh, and apply a um, egg to fry survival rate. Um, and since the, and so that was that was the case for some time, and then starting in brood year 2015, which be water 20 years 2016, there was a method used called it was referred to as the JPI um, method. Um, uh, you, many people people know that the JPI is the juvenile juvenile production index, and it's an estimate of uh, fry passage fry equivalent passage at a red blood conversion yeah. And um, and so instead of using spawners and a um, egg to fry survival rate to get the number of fry, we just directly use the fry equivalent um, uh, JPI um, to do that. And so that model was used for a few years. So we refer to it as the JPI model. And then since brood year 2019, um, there's been a different model referred to as model two, which is very descriptive, um, but uh, that's, that's what it's been called. So that's what we've been using um, uh, since then. Okay, and this is just a, um, this is just a, the basic equation of um, the JPE. Let's see. There's the JPE right there. Um, the JPI 
uh, in year T minus one, um, that is the fry equivalent passage. Again, uh, most of that passage occurs um, in the fall and early winter. Um, so that's why it's uh, from the previous year. And after that, we have the, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, an egg to front, or fry to smolt survival rate, F, and then a smolt survival rate, S sub N. And um, those, those occur generally after the new year. So, and the JPE itself is uh, for um, year T, whereas the JPI is measured in year T. T minus one. Okay. Um, let's see here if I can list anything here. So, that was for the natural origin fish. Um, the hatchery origin winter run um, is a bit simpler. Um, the JPE for hatchery origin fish in year T is um, equal to the production from the hatchery times a small survival rate. Um, hatchery origin um, went around and released as uh, referred to as pre smolts and um, they uh, are they they are put into the river near um, Reading um, at a time that is usually after um, the JPI throughout the river before I have passed through the red left origin. And this is just the um, uh, illustration that I took from uh, the brood year 2023 JPE letter, um, just to give a perspective of where all of this is happening. And uh, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, and you were, probably became more familiar with it if you were on the um, trip yesterday. I was not there, but um, I, I understand that you got to see a lot, a large part of the basin. And um, so. On the left-hand side, we have the natural origin um, component of, uh, of the winter chinook here. And in the top there, uh, we have, you can see the, um, up there, in the near Battle Creek, but upstream of there is the upper river, um, the you know, end of anatomy, and uh, where many of the uh, natural origin winter runs spawn at the upper end, just below Desert Dam. Um, and then downward, if we go down, um, those fish, those fish that are uh, produced naturally in the upper river um, get counted at Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Um, and that's where we get our JPI number. Um, and then we um, also get, um, th th at that point below there, we're going to calculate a, um, um, what is it? The, uh, See, this has been, it's been a long time. This is, I, I should have prepared better for this, but uh, um, in, uh, the fry to smolt survival rate. And we assume that happens, you know, after pass, passage of Red Bluff Diversion Dam, and, um, um, but before getting to the Delta, um, which is in, uh, at Tower Bridge in Sacramento. After that, after we apply that survival, fry to smolt survival rate, then we apply a smolt survival rate um, to that gets us to the number of projected fish uh, entering the delta. On the right hand side here, um, we have uh, the, the hatchery origin component to this. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the hatchery releases generally occur, um, and well, they, they, they're released in near Reading um, and generally in the February timeframe. I think. The practice is still to release fish um, in times of favorable environmental conditions for better survival. Um, and so I, I, I don't, it's not a fixed date. I think it's uh, somewhat fluid there. Um, and then um, we get, we have a small survival rate for those, uh, apply a small survival rate to those releases to get the number of fish at Delta entry. Now, there's also some, um, language here about Battle Creek uh, smolts entering. I have, have not been involved since the Jumpstart program started. My understanding is that there has been uh, hatchery origin um, smolts, hatchery origin winter run that are outplanted in uh, Battle Creek um, to help uh, reestablish winter run in that watershed. And I don't know exactly where um, that stands right now, um, but uh, 
it is it, in, in these recent years it has been part of the uh, JPD calculation. So um, we, uh, me and, and colleagues, uh, uh, Will Satterthwaite, um, Noble Hendricks, and Michael Moore, um, we were asked to look into the JPE several years ago now and uh, see if we could propose alternatives to um, how the JPE is calculated each year. And, um, and we did that. We published a, a paper in, I think, 2018 um, that um attempted to do just that and we first thought throughout the all the work that we did on this project we we maintained the same jpe um approach which is the, the equation here that i have reprinted on almost every slide i've shown so far today um so that part has has changed changed little has not changed at all but it's just the estimation of those components on the right-hand side of that equation um, that we looked into. So I'm going to just um, briefly walk through um, what we found um, in the in our um, work on this uh, project. So method one is essentially what um, we've already talked about. This is the status quo approach, um, which is the JPI model. That was what was being used at the time when we first started working on this. Um, Mike, can you hold the microphone? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do so. Um, okay, and then the, we applied a, a fry to small survival rate, that's F. Um, that was a constant value of 0.59 that was um, had been used for some time and it was attributed to work by Halleck. Um, that particular um, rate was hard to. Um, at least for me, uh, was hard to find the origins of it. It's there, um, but there's not a lot of details about it. And so, um, it, and it had been used for quite some time. And so, anyway, that um, since we were just using this uh, alternative as a as the status quo, we retained that uh, 0.59 uh, brightest month survival rate. And um, and then for the small survival rate, that was based on a variance weighted mean of survival estimates from acoustic tagging studies that have been going on for some time now. I believe 2013 or even prior to that. Not totally sure exactly when they started. And so um, the small survival rate was based on this variance weighted mean of survival estimates from these tagging studies. Um, all the, and we used a binomial model to estimate that and did not account for detection probabilities. The second method um, here, uh, similar, again, the equation is in the upper right this time uh, you know, for the basic approach. Uh, we did uh, um, try to account for uncertainty um, to a greater degree um, than alternative one, which really didn't account for uncertainty at all. Um, and so we looked into um, applied observation or variance associated with ob observation error um, for the JPI, the private small survival rate, and the small survival rate to get an overall variance estimate for the JPI forecast. And so um, the again we use the uh, the Fry equivalent JPI as the starting point. Uh, next we uh, developed a new approach to forecasting the uh, fry to small survival rate. Um, that's depicted in this, in this plot reference right here. Uh, and here, this is just a plot of the natural origin survival rate um, on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the hatchery uh, origin uh, survival rate. And these are survival rates um, from essentially um, uh, release or um, for release from the hatchery or on, on the natural origin side from red blood diversion dam to after their first year in the ocean. And so what this provided was um, a measure of very similar amounts of time in the ocean, but um, different amounts of time in the river between the small and, and fry. And so we fit um, a linear model to this and um, the, the, the um, 
slope of that line uh, is is the estimated um, try to small survival rate. And that changes every year as we update with new data. Um, moving on to the small survival rates, they were based on the variance weighted mean of survival rates using the Cormac Jolly Seaver model. And as I mentioned, it uh, accounts for detection probabilities. In this case. The third method um, we um, implemented was. Uh, was a Bayesian approach, um, and each of the components of the JPE um, are um, uh, are expressed express as probability distributions. Um, these this accounts for um, observation error in the JPI and the Friday small survival rate, and the distribution of the uh, small survival rates is from a, a Bayesian model, hierarchical model, and this just gives a um, you know, an idea of what the different components look like in this uh, in this approach. Um, this approach um, um, was fairly data light when we completed this work, and uh, you can see the the number of observations here for the small survival rate. Um, and so, at the time, we were a little bit nervous about proposing this because. Uh, you know, uh, heavily dependent on prior uh, distribution assumptions. Okay. So I breezed through pretty quickly the um, the work that we did. Um, and this is sort of just summarizing it here. We have three alternative models. Um, one thing that is hard uh, from I mean, the JPE is a forecast. Um, we do lots of forecasting in the ocean fishery world. That's what our allowable exploitation rates depend upon. Um, but uh, we have an advantage there. We have a postseason estimate of what we're trying to forecast, and we can see how well our forecasts do. And in this case, we, we don't. Um, we don't have a postseason JPE um, based on monitoring data, for instance. Um, so we don't really know how good we're doing. Um, at this point, um, and so, and we're not really able to, you know, estimate the forecast scale. Um, in in the paper, we recommended the use of um, model two, um, and it counts for observation error. Um, it's reproducible. It's most small survival rates estimated by a market capture model, um, and the group, the work group, um, did endorse the use of. Um, Model two uh, in Brugier 2019, and um, I think continue to do so um, to this day. And um, this is my last slide, and I, um, well, some time has gone by since we did this work, and I'm. Um, it seems possible that some of the things that were missing, uh, or maybe not as satisfactory as we would like, um, could be improved, and and so. Uh, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we used in, in or, well, well, I was going to get that mixed up here, but I'm going to go with the second bullet first because that would be really great if we had postseason estimates of the JPE, and we can see how well we do, and we can look at alternative models and, and assess their performance. Um, until we have that, it's it's hard to imagine um, how we um, improve this uh, and really know that we're doing a better job. Um, and the top bullet here, I pointed out that we used an um, indirect approach to getting the pride of small survival rate. Um, again, we can't ver verify the accuracy of that. Um, and But there may be some hope, and this, uh, I'm not totally sure if this is the case. I've, I've heard that this is the case, but the tag, tagging um, tag sizes have gotten smaller and we're able to tag some, you know, much younger fish and track them through the system. And it may be possible to implant tags small enough to uh, give bite to fish as they go through the red level version down. Perhaps, I don't know the answer to this, but if we could, that would be great because it would allow us to eat, uh, 
to uh, to be forecast allow allow the JPE to be forecast without explicitly trying to account for that Friday small survival rate, which uh, you know is kind of it's not it's not a direct a directly estimated survival rate and something that um, could be improved with uh, better tech, uh, tagging tech call. I think that's it uh, for me. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Michael. Uh, questions on the juvenile production as to the complaint uh, of those Thanks for thanks for the presentations. I really value the portion uh, of the juvenile production um, estimates and so forth in the sense that it gives us a, a sense of how to kind of do that. Is it in my case the the survivorship? Okay, so that's that's interesting to see. Um, um, but I'm going to ask a, a question that's related to this uh, as well as the uh, earlier one, but uh, very great. And it's a question I've been receiving a lot, and I, I would just like to hear uh, your responses to that. And that is uh, the question of uh, when the releases should occur. Should they occur earlier in the long stage, like one day, or should they occur later, like later, like two or three months? And, uh, and the spin on that is um, uh, would that be something that you consider? Uh, one of the neighbors told her, uh, and it's sort of be adapted that way. And on top of that, question that, um, why don't you just put forward in? Uh, so you could answer this question. Thank you. I'm sure who wants to go first, or if you have anything like Rachel. Uh, yeah, Rachel could come back up here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, if I'm understanding your question was um, evaluating the trade-offs between water releases for the egg stage versus water releases for no, sorry, releasing the organisms. Oh, oh, right. hatchery, hatchery releases, right, right. Juvenile stage, for example, yeah. as opposed to egg stage. You, you know, egg stage will be on upstream or juveniles later on, leaving the hatchery for a while, releasing. I'm going to just refresh. I'm going to try to make sure I understand the question. So, are you asking about the trade off about kind of bringing the eggs back up into the McLeod as one sort, you know, because it's the same hatchery and we're moving eggs from the hatchery up into the McLeod now versus keeping them in the hatchery and releasing the metal leader life stage downstream? Um, what I would just offer is that um, for sure. If we want to reestablish um, more than a single population of winter run, we need to continue to bring eggs and or ultimately having the fish swim up there, right? So there's different phases of what that would look like. I think in the near term, I know that the winter run life cycle model has a reintroduction module to it, but we're really looking at those trade-offs. And those trade-offs are complicated because we always think of it from an abundance perspective, sure. right? And yet the value of bringing a whole population back online is like an important piece that's not captured particularly well yet in the model. Um, it's more just kind of a, um, because it's a finite population right now, it's like, what's the probability? So in the drought year, it was very clear that the temperature dependent mortality of the eggs if we left them there was going to be catastrophic. So it allowed for the scientific and the political bravery to start learning about the reintroduction effort and bringing the eggs back up into the ancestral waters, right? Because they were gonna die if we, left them there. So the cost of learning demographically was lower than if it was a good year and they were going to be thriving, right? But we do need to come up with the long-term plan around all of that. Like what's the role of the hatchery? What, how are we going to reestablish these populations in more, in more than one location? And then there's also the complexity about like, when do you release hatchery fish? Which is like a very interventive question. Like what calendar date is it? And I know that there's a lot of advancements in trying to look at meteorologic conditions and trying to make sure that the fish can the, you know, leave on um, a good winter storm. Um, but I also think that there's just a lot of value in getting fish out of infrastructure and letting them have the volitional. I think fish and rivers do it best. And I think we're 
mediocre sometimes in our ability to match them into that environment. So I think rewilding them and letting them have kind of more of their autonomy and volitionally interacting with the river is usually a better choice than having us feed them in raceways and making their decisions for them. If I can briefly defend uh, my life cycle model uh, against Rachel's uh, accusation that it wasn't quite there yet. Um, it's not my life cycle model at all. <laughs> but uh, you no, know, we are working on improvements. And, and what she was referring to is, is that, that this reintroduction component um, has determined that it's it, it's it's only really uh, affects population growth in years with high Keswick downstream temperature uh, dependent mortality, temperature dependent mortality, and that uh, otherwise it's more beneficial to leave them in the river. And that's the, the sort of short term view. She's referring to the long term view of multiple populations. But we are working on an extinction model that takes the. Um, so this is getting more into the details, but Calcim, the, the long term operations model, works on 100 years of historic hydrology and then perturbs that according to, to different climate change scenarios, but it, 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 most applications of it maintain that same sequence of hydrologic years. So a route sequence is going to just be repeated. We're working on a, an effort uh, in, uh, uh, funded by uh, Cal Fish and Wildlife to perturb that sequence of drought years and, and generate uh, artificial sequences where we can look from anywhere from one to six year droughts run those through the life cycle model and, and determine extinction risks based on that. So coupled that with reintroduction, uh, with the reintroduction module, we can we can better have an, a, a, a better prediction forecast of extinction risk and the benefit of reintroduction together. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we guys can say just one more question um, before we'll take it to the sort of like a calm down question that you can feel free to respond to whatever you want. So, I think one of the things you just said, which I want to clarify as part of the context of the question, is it's my understanding is that that relationship about um, when moving fish makes sense is predicated on the survival rates that are modeled and all survival rates that are derived from fish being in trucks. So that's like a really short term analysis that doesn't look at like the range of survival rates associated with the different migration uh, potential, the volitional passage up or down, which I think is super important. In the context of you know thinking about long term planning, so I wanted to clarify that. My question is, it feels like to, for me one of the complexities around where run is I love where you started your presentation, which was like got a fish from the mountains living in a hot valley, and to me that's like the same population, and there's this requirement to maintain. A certain number of populations, you know, within the diversity group. And, and I guess to me, that feels contrived in this particular case. It's like we're going to take a portion of this population, move it up high to where it should actually be, call it a different population. And then we have our number of populations, but we still have this constraint managing this population down low. So I guess I just have a question about. What if we can successfully get fish up in the five? What is the value of any of preserving them in low red? Yeah. And then my related second question is in reorienting, I have encountered many people who believe that one of the primary impacts of all run right now is management of temperatures and limits. And so, do you share that perspective, and how do you see the trade off between managing the litter run and wet water and management for all of them? Who would like to start? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to suggest that we don't give the microphone to her name. <laughs> That's where I would start this. Um, 
Really, really great questions. Um, I, I would have to think long and hard about the, the one of the first ones about the benefits or uh, whether whether it's worth maintaining that population below Keswick once you had established a population above. I, I, I'm I'm not going to touch that. I think it's an important question, but I, I don't have a response to that immediately. But I do think it's a really important question, particularly in regards to your follow-up question about fall run and and managing water for winter run comes at a cost for for fall run, and that is one of those trade-offs that uh, I was referring to in my presentation, and that. Again, in a system where it is so completely uh, allocated and we're running at at maximum uh, for all the objectives, um, everything's going to involve trade-offs. And, and I, I, I don't have the quantitative answer about how much, if you all of a sudden ignored winter run, how much more benefit you could provide for fall run. I, we haven't done that. We have the capacity to do that with the models we're developing, but um, so I don't know uh, how significant that would be. It, it might be very significant. It might also not, it, uh, given that you're still you're still having all the other objectives that you need to meet over the summer for water deliveries. That water is still going out. So um, I, I don't have a good answer for you that for, for that one. I'm just going to try to take a stab at envisioning like the future in the way that like Renee just aspirationally put all the fish up into the McLeod. And I'm going to like say that they don't want to be on the valley floor. Like every time anybody who's been to the Tarpa survey, like they're literally trying to get smell the McLeod water and get up there. Right. So there's no, to me, value of that habitat for that fish. I think that like in my opening, they're looking for stable, cold water in the McLeod and in the pit and in battle and in the habitats that they have evolved. So there's nothing about like the Noah's Ark two by two population and diversity groups that I find like important to keep them where they are. I think we do need to be able to have them in in habitats that are diverse so that we they're not at a risk of all eggs in one basket. They need to be the right baskets, right? And so I don't know what that looks like in terms of carrying capacities on the McLeod and in the upper Sacramento, um, but I envision a future that, that that could be the case, right? That they we could have enough habitat and that those fish would, would reside there and not being managed on the valley floor. I don't know how the volitional swimway attends to that, I don't know the mechanisms, but um, I think we should try to manifest that because I don't think that there is necessarily like an inherent value of keeping that population there and managing them there if there's better alternatives that we can create for them elsewhere. Great. Well, thank you. We're going to take a break um, now, but before we do that, um, I just wanted to remind folks, if you would like to speak in the open mic session, please sign up so we can plan that time accordingly and make sure everyone who wishes to has the opportunity to say a few words. Um, so we're going to reconvene at 11.15. Uh, and uh, let's just thank the nymphs, you know, Michael, Eric, and Rachel for coming up, for being so well prepared and speaking to the committee. So thank you.